Hello, Sophia here. I'm wondering if you've ever been curious about what it's like to work with a fashion stylist or what a sex club is like for someone in a fat body or what are the weight neutral approaches to PCOS treatment or what I thought about the Aubrey Gordon, Your Fat Friend film. Well, over on the Fat Joy newsletter, I am sharing these personal stories and practical strategies for living in our diet culture world. When you subscribe for free, you'll get an email from me about twice per month. Um, I'm also recording video conversations with incredible fat people, as well as amazing fat allies. And I want to share these people with you. So if you want some more Fat Joy, please go to fatjoy.com dot substack dot com. That is fat joy F A T J O Y dot substack S U B S T A C K dot com. And subscribe to get all of this fat joy goodness in your inbox. Okay. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Hello, lovelies. Welcome to the Fat Joy Podcast, where we talk each week about how to flourish in an anti-fat world. I'm Sophia Apostle, a fat professional coach who loves talking to other fat people about what it's like to live within oppressive systems that marginalize our bodies and how we still dare to have the audacity and courage to reach towards our collective liberation and embrace our joy. Please know this is an adult content podcast, so there will be swears. We will be talking about harms we've experienced, and we will be rebelling against weight stigma, diet culture, fat phobia, ableism, racism, etc. You can get more Fat Joy goodness, including how you can support the podcast through my newsletter at fatjoy.substack.com. And for episode transcripts, book reviews, and show notes, head to the Fat Joy website at fatjoy.life. I am so glad you're here. Enjoy this episode. Hello, lovelies. Welcome back to the Fat Joy podcast. I am so excited for my guest today because we have Aubrey Gordon back. Hey, Aubrey. Hi. <laughs> I'm so glad to talk to you again. Thank you for having me. This is such a I was going to say this is such a joy, but of course it is. Right? It is. It is such a joy to hang out with you and talk to you. We've been like, you know, totally chatting already for 15 minutes. And we're like, we should probably hit record. Um, so if someone does not know who you are, which I find very hard to believe, but if someone doesn't, um, <laughs> you have been up to so much since you were last on the podcast. I think when you were on last time... Um, I, I don't think your second book had come out yet, which is called You Just Need to Lose Weight, or and it was maybe about to come out. I certainly didn't know anything about the movie. Um, that was a big secret. Um, and uh, yeah, and so tell us like, I don't know, you probably have gotten very good at this point with all the travel you've been doing with like, like, here's who I am in like five sentences. Do you have like one of those? Sure. Uh, great. Yes. Uh, so I um, uh, am probably best known at this point for co-hosting a podcast called Maintenance Phase with Michael Hobbs, where we um, debunk uh, and sort of unpack uh, the sort of diet and wellness industries. Um, I've written a couple of books, including What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat and You Just Need to Lose Weight and 19 Other Myths About Fat People. And I'm about two thirds of the way through another one that'll be coming out uh, next year. Very exciting. Very exciting. Um, and uh, most recently have just been on tour with the release of a documentary uh, directed by the good and great Jeannie Finley um, called Your Fat Friend that is about uh, me and about uh, my relationship with my parents, my boomer parents. Yeah. So that's the that's the rundown. Oh my gosh. And yeah, I mean <laughs> everything you do is amazing and so no for real. I'm going to gush a little bit. I have to say it's very fun talking to you a second time because the first time I felt so nervous and I was basically like almost in tears because I was like, "Oh my god, it's Aubrey Gordon." And now I'm like not that it I'm like, "I know Aubrey. I know Aubrey." Um and though, yes, and 
I still want to gush about you because the work that you're doing, I mean, it it is, it really is. I I I believe it with every fiber of my being. It is changing the discourse around fatness in a way that I don't know. I mean, I don't think that it's happened quite this way for a long time. And I think it's because you have such a great mix of um, fact and research and um, and that you also have a lot of like sarcastic humor that goes along with it. I feel like that's a winning combo is the humor <laughs> and the wit. A full of sugar. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I just I'm so glad for the work that you're doing and it makes it so easy I will say oh not not that this is ever easy but when I'm in conversation with people or trying to um <laughs> highlight to people why my body is okay the way it is it's like I just say go check out maintenance phase. And then part two will be to go check out Reagan Chastain. And then if you really want, you can read this book by Sabrina Strings and this other one by Deshaun Harrison. Like, like it's just, it's such a great entry point for people who are highly skeptical about anything that I want to say as a fat woman who is, they view it as I'm a fat woman defending myself. And I'm like, no, go listen to Aubrey. I just, so thanks for doing all that work because that means I don't have to. Thank you so much. That was uh, certainly the goal is a, as you say, an entry point, right? If I'm the first fat person whose work you've read, uh, I should most definitely not be the last, right? Um, which is why each of the books have like reading lists and citations till the cows come home and all of that kind of stuff is to point folks in those directions. And the other thing is, uh, Prior to starting writing, I was a community organizer for a long time, knocking on people's doors, being like, I'm gay, do you think I should have anything? <laughs> what, what do you think? So I've got a pretty calloused hand uh, on that front and uh, have a great deal more patience, I think, for thin people's nonsense uh, than a lot of fat people do or should, right? Like, we shouldn't have to have this level of uh, patience. So it felt like if there was stuff that I could pull together that other folks could do exactly what you're talking about and being like, just go read this piece. Just go listen to this episode. Just go watch this movie, whatever the thing is, um, <clears throat> that I could save folks a lot of the awkwardness and heartache of trying to navigate that on your own, which I think is what most of us as fat people are used to, right? Is just like kind of, being out there on your own and trying to figure out which battles you want to pick uh, and trying to figure out how to wage them and feeling like you need to have a dissertation ready every time you want to defend your right to like not have comments made about your body at the gym or whatever, right? Um, yeah, I'm so, I'm so glad that it's landing that way for you because that is absolutely the goal. Oh, good. Well, gold star for you because it, it really, yeah, it really, really does. It works that way for sure. So I'm so, I love that that was one of your intentions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so I want to dive into the movie, Your Fat Friend. Um, I had mentioned to you and people who are regular listen listeners of the podcast will know that I got to speak to the incredible Jeannie Finlay on the podcast um, and we had such a fun conversation. It's kind of impossible not to have a fun conversation. I with have her. to say I'm kind of jealous that you guys got to spend so much time together. Like yeah, seven years, baby. This is a long time. <laughs> We've had a lot of time together. Yeah, absolutely. No, she's wonderful. Oh, so good. So good. Um, okay, so my first question is, how hard was it keeping that secret for so many years? Like, did you even know it was like, I'm just, it's become so, such a phenom. Like, it's huge. It's touring. Every fat person I know is like, have you seen your fat friend? Have you seen your fat friend? Oh, I'm going to see your fat friend. Um, and you, this is like seven years in the making. Yeah, totally. Uh, well, listen, I was anonymous for a long time, so I'm a real secret keeper over here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. True, you're so good at that. Sure. It's uh, I. It's a little bit disarming. I wish I were less good at You know what I mean? I find it, like, slightly troubling. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it was um, not a hard secret to keep 
it was, I would say, a hard process to go through, not because of uh, Jeannie. Jeannie's wonderful. I think she's the best case scenario of how something like this goes. Incredibly con- communicative, uh, incredibly sort of consent based. Uh, it's the first time in my life that someone has booked travel for me and has just been like, hey, we're going to book you into business class because we can be reasonably sure that you're not going to get kicked out there. So we're just going to budget for that and fundraise for that. And that's what we're going to do to make sure that you can get where you're going. She said that. And I was like, I had tears in my eyes. I was like, you took such good care. Like she took such good care. She was so thoughtful about every piece along the way. And I will say, uh, you know, throughout the process of filming, the stakes sort of kept changing for me. When we first started filming, I was writing anonymously on the internet. God bless that lady for taking a chance on someone who had written one blog post on a free platform on the internet. A gamble that paid off for her, but would not for most. Um, (laughs) uh, The stakes kept changing for me. And over time, you know, by the end of filming, I'm sure she had two or 300 hours of me and my family and uh, my work and all of it at its best and at its worst and at its most spectacular and its most boring. And when someone has that much material, you just don't know what's going to come out of it at the end. And it takes a pretty immense amount of trust to be like, follow me around all the time, film me all the time, and then I trust you to edit it together the story that you find and the story that you see fit. And I can't, first of all, I can't really imagine doing that with someone who wasn't also a VAT person. Um, And second of all, I can't, I just can't imagine doing it with anybody else. She was the perfect person to work with on this. Just perfect. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. For me watching it, the scenes with your family were so, oh, Aubrey, like, they broke my heart. And because of like, I was like, ah, I've had that conversation. Like, it was the empathy piece, the, yep, that exact same thing, those exact same words. And I imagine there were a lot of people, and you've probably heard, that's probably not a comment you haven't heard before. Like, just the, oh, yeah, like, I could have just easily switched places with you. And the exact same thing has happened to me and still does. And that, it really... You were so, I don't even know what the word is, Aubrey, like bold, courageous, trusting to have that shown. Yeah. I mean, I think the the courage belongs to my parents. I don't know if you've uh, heard the ways that people talk about parents, but it's not great, right? Like it's not great. And I think being on camera saying, I'm not sure that we got this right is a massively vulnerable thing to do. And I would say as vulnerable, if not more so than anything I've, anything I've done, uh, in part because those two are not public figures, right? (laughs) My parents are not, they're just a, a retired pilot and a retired teacher living their lives, you know? making their weekly trips to Costco. (laughs) That's about it. Uh, Yeah, I am so blown away by their not just willingness to participate in the process, but from their deep enthusiasm for it. My mom came along on the UK tour uh, for the film and Jeannie had a brilliant idea Uh, which was my mom didn't want to be on stage for Q&As. That felt like a little much for her. So Jeannie was like, well, about 20 minutes into the Q&A, we'll turn it over to the audience for questions. What if we just had Pam holding the microphone and running it around to people? And every night the reaction was the same. I have like four identical videos from different cities. I just quietly videoed from the stage uh, to send to my niece and nephew who are her biggest fans. Uh, People just would go, <gasps> and then <laughs> like, like a slow celebrity response. Totally, totally. 
which is like if you love your mom like i love my mom you're like yes it's correct that there is a theater full of people cheering for my mom you're all having the right response to my mom she's great yeah it's so wonderful it's so wonderful i love that she got to experience that wow me too Uh uh-huh and i mean and then I really, the other part that really struck me about the family piece was at the end, and it's been a couple of months or maybe like six months since I saw, I saw one of the early like buy it, stream it, watch it over the weekend. But at the end when your dad kind of has a bit of an epiphany in the bookstore and that was, oh, I get, I feel it thinking about it. It's so beautiful. It was so beautiful. Well, I'll tell you what. That guy has continued to blow me away with his growth since then. A of all, uh, I was over at his house, I don't know, six or eight months ago, and he got a phone call. He wears hearing aids, and the phone calls just come into his hearing aids, so you'll just be talking to him, and then I'll go, hey, Bob, and just walk off. <laughs> You're like, all right, dad's got a phone call. Uh, he he did one of those and walked off and I heard him from the next room a few minutes later going, it was built by an astronomer. It doesn't mean anything. And he was absolutely yelling at one of his friends about referring to the BMI. Are you kidding? I am not. That guy continues to just absolutely knock it out of the park. And uh, we had a three-week run at a movie theater in Portland, the Hollywood theater. It's one of my faves. Um, And uh, he organized a group. He like flew friends in to come see the movie. He was recruiting people like it's so he could not be more proud of every part of it. And it's just wonderful. It's just wonderful. Yeah. Both of those guys just leaps and bounds all the time. Here's the other one. Sorry. I have so many. I'm, I'm so proud of both of them. Um, <clears throat> at one stop on the tour, our Q&A host was um, Siobhan McSweeney, who's the host of The Great Pottery Throwdown and plays Sister Michael on Dairy Girls. She's one of the funniest people I've maybe ever met. Um, unprompted during that Q&A, uh, Siobhan led the audience in a chant of fuck, wait, watchers, fuck, wait, watchers over and over and over again. Apropos of truly nothing. We were not talking about weight watchers. She just was like, oh yeah, these guys are bad news. Uh, started the chant. And then my mom, my little troll of a mom, I love it so much. Uh, we were in the uh, car afterwards uh, heading off to dinner and my mom was texting and I was like who are you texting and she was like oh just texting some friends and she rattled off the names of the friends and they are all of her friends who are on Weight Watchers and she was telling them about like having a great time in Glasgow just led the ch- led the crowd in the chant of fuck Weight Watchers anyway hope you're doing well <laughs> oh my god <laughs> okay so they have they're like on board with fat liberation They are getting that like, listen, for like suburban white boomer parents, I, I think they're, uh, pushing the envelope amongst their peer group in a really wonderful way. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm thrilled to death with both of them. It's, it's amazing. That is amazing. My dad heard somebody the other day, this was just a couple days ago, I was over at his house and one of his friends said something about, well, we all know that sugar causes cancer. And my dad just flew off the handle and was like, there's no evidence of that. Have a piece of cake. (laughs) Great. Good job, Rusty. Well, which is so different from like in the movie, there was that whole like, it's a sugar-free cake. It's a sugar-free cake, Aubrey, Aubrey, it's a sugar-free cake. And I remember watching that going, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Like, stop saying it's a sugar-free cake. It's fine. And I remember your face was kind of confused, but you're so like, I have to say, I really admired seeing those moments and how you, like, you were just maybe not fully neutral. I felt I could feel that you were feeling things. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but but you were like <laughs> but you were very you were very diplomatic and you some of them you just like didn't even comment on other times you might have a conversation but I just admired that because I have not figured out how to be that way at all yet yeah and listen there are a million different approaches that fat people can and do take in moments like that 
all of which are valid. Uh, I really like my parents. And that means that I treat them like people that I like. Uh, and that means, uh, you know, talking about that stuff one on one or, you know what I mean? Like affording folks the dignity of, you know, like, uh, having conversations offline about that kind of stuff feels really important to me because that's how I would want them to do it with me. Right. Uh, and I would also say, listen, we've been through much bigger and harder things as a family, uh, including, you know, their divorce, but also including me coming out and like a bunch of other. So like, this is all sort of like, I feel like we've been here before. Do you know what I mean? And like, I kind of know the ropes from last time. Yeah. There's almost like a, like a, not a practiced approach necessarily, but like a, we've, we've walked hard waters before. Like we can, we're going to get through this. We know what to do. Totally. And I mean, listen, one of the things that, um, uh, folks end up asking about quite a bit uh, around the film is just like, where do you start? How do you do it? How do you have these conversations with your family and your loved ones and all of that kind of stuff? And uh, <clears throat> the trick is for me, again, having been through this before, I I knew and remembered that last time my mom had a hard time uh, talking about it when I first came out but she is a hyper intellectual lady. So I would, when I was in college, send her like Judith Butler articles and we would talk about the ideas without having to talk about the feelings part as a way in for her. Uh, for my dad, it's really important, I think, for him to feel like he's on the same team, he's on the side of right. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, that if he feels like he's... Uh, out of step with other folks that feels really bad to him. So I think finding ways to make him feel like, come on, we're all doing this. Come on down. Right. Felt really important. And I think that kind of observation about the people that you know and love is really, really critical. You can see what makes them change, you know, what speaks to them and what doesn't. Right. Um, so it allows each of us to make these kinds of bespoke uh, kind of approaches that are really tailored to the person um, and to what we know about that person. Same goes for institutions, right? You can see what makes institutions change or not uh, and then replicate those things is a really uh, important part of the process. I'm curious about for you with all of this family, we're talking family stuff. Um, have you, you mentioned having had conversations like this in the past. I'm curious about what your experience with those conversations is. What's the, like, do they usually go the way you think they're going to go? Do they usually go sideways and you find yourself surprised by it? How do you feel sort of managing your own, like, uh, you know, uh, inter strong internal emotions uh, while you're uh, trying to walk someone through a conversation that they might not be familiar with? Like, I'm curious about how all that feels to you and how you feel like it lands for yeah, you. Yeah, it's such a good question. Oh, it's uh, it's also a big question. It's a big, <laughs> well, it's a big question, and it's a big question, and it's interesting because it has changed over the years. So, I think I kind of came to fat liberation by way of body positivity, like many of us do, um, and started setting little boundaries. It's probably like 10-ish, 10 plus years ago, started setting boundaries with my family around, look, mom, when you call me and if you ask about my weight or about my exercise, I want you to know I will hang up the phone because I'm not interested in having those kinds of conversations. And so we did that. I hung up on my mom a lot at the beginning and then she kind of stopped, which was great. And then, you know, as I became more aware and more knowledgeable about the research around anti-fatness and anti-fat bias and a lot of the things that you talk about in maintenance phase, a lot of the, the research that Reagan Chastain dives into in her health, uh, weight and healthcare newsletter. That's right. That's the right name. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And so, and the thing is too, so my parents are both in the medical field or they were before oh, they retired. Oh, buddy. 
So you got a whole other level of thorny nonsense. That's where it stopped. Basically, they could they have not been able to. I don't know how to say without. So talking about emotions, it's big emotions for me because I feel like they don't believe me. And so I actually have gone no contact with them for the last two years, which has been awful and I, not what I wanted, but I kept being harmed. And, and it wasn't, and again, like they are, they're, they're amazing people. And I, and it really has become basically, I've become quite estranged from most of my family now, my extended, like my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, because of it. But like they, there's a, and this is where it's hard because I'm, I'm, I'm a coach, right? Like the work I do is as a coach and I'm trained as a coach. So what I, what I say sounds like kind of, I don't know if it's for the word pedantic or whatever, but like what I see is a lack of openness and curiosity. And so I don't know where to go with them if there isn't an ability for them to be in the curiosity. So like my brother sent me a thing, an email about Ozempic and I was like, dude, this is like not, this is pretty much the worst email you could send me. You know my boundaries around this. I'm not interested in eradicating my body or harming it in any way. There is nothing wrong with my fatness. And he, again, there was no curiosity around why I would say such a thing. It was very much like a, a, a real pushback and a, well, I think you're being ridiculous. <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't know where to go from there. I just, I don't know where to go from there. And it's interesting. I talked, I had um, Adrian Marie Brown on as a guest, which was like. Oh my God. I know. What? Another guest where I was like sobbing as I'm like. Hey, Get of the Marie universe. Brown. Yeah, absolutely. I would also be crying. <laughs> She's an angel. She is an angel on this earth and you can feel it. Um, but I talked to her about this because they do, her family does a lot around like kitchen table justice and like how do we bring restorative practices in? And so much of when when she was talking about it, it just became so clear that it really, there has to be a reciprocity. There has to be a willingness on both sides. And I just got tired of trying I, and getting nowhere and I I kept being harmed again and again and so I just drew a line and I I will share that I think what I'm waiting for is at some point to have a and I don't even know if this is how it works but in my mind it's like I think maybe at some point I will mm, mature develop I don't know to a level where in my own kind of self-development journey where I can fully accept who they are and not be harmed when I see or hear comments about my body. And I keep wondering, I'm like, is this the year that happens? But I also don't know if, I just don't know. I just know right now it doesn't feel right to go into those spaces because my family is very embedded in diet culture and everything they do. And, and, you know, just in all the ways that people are embedded in diet culture. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Oh God, that's all so tricky. And I'm sorry to hear it, but I'm glad that you have uh, found a solution that works for you and gives you a sense of, you know, peace of mind to some level or dignity to some level or protection to some level, right? Like that's really, I'm glad that you've landed on a strategy that feels like it's, hard but it's working for you is what it sounds like i mean the hard truth is that it's made my life a lot easier yeah god that's tough and i hate that truth but it is it, that's the paradox right it's like that's true and it still sucks and it's also true like yeah well this is another place where it feels like this just mimics so many conversations with so many queer and trans friends over the years right that there is this like massive distance as well as uh disabled kids of non-disabled parents as well as transracial adoptees as well as any number of things that puts some daylight between uh our pretty fundamental experiences of the world and our parents pretty fundamental experiences of the world um that's a big that's a big thing to figure out how to handle and there's just not a single right 
answer on it, right? Every solution is an imperfect solution. And boy, oh boy, they're all real tough. So I'm, I'm glad that you have found the tough one that works for you. Oof. Oof. What a lift. What a lift. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we reference this in the film as well, but my dad and I didn't speak for several years for uh, similar reasons. Not quite the same, but similar reasons where I was just like, I can't right now. And when I came back to him, did the same thing of like, I'm going to hang up. I'm going to get up and leave the room, that sort of thing. And that's what brought us back. And now we are, I would say, closer than I ever would have imagined that we would be. Uh, and also that's an unusual way for that story to go. You know, that's an unusual way for that story to go. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. We just got right into it, buddy. <laughs> I was just thinking, I mean, I, I'm so happy to talk about it because I don't think we, I don't think, I think it's so taboo around like distancing from family, but they're your family. And it's like, yes. And there has to be the yes. And, and when I do talk about it with people, honestly, like, I heard a stat. Oh, I'm going to totally get it wrong. But some like much higher percentage than I would have thought. Something like, and it was on a podcast that I heard, something like 35 or 40% of people have some level of estrangement with someone in their family. Like it was, and I was shocked because we don't talk about it, right? So I like talking about it because I think it makes people who are experiencing it less alone and feel less wrong. Because I, I do feel... There's like a guilt I feel. There's like, am I a bad daughter? But am I being selfish, putting myself first? Like there's a lot of that stuff that goes along with it. And I think that we have, I really, be, I mean, I'm a coach, I can't help it. Like, I believe that we have to talk about this kind of stuff openly. Absolutely. Uh, also, we are living in a post Jeanette McCurdy world. Uh, and I'm glad my mother died, the book I'm glad my mother died, right? Like where there is just a little more space for that kind of conversation than there used to be. Uh, and that feels really, really useful. I also think it's useful to talk about that stuff as, you know, in some cases it will be, at the time it always feels like it's going to be forever, right? At the time of disconnection, it always feels like, oh God, I'm jumping off a cliff with this relationship and I have no idea where I'm going to land. Right. Um, and I think it's important to talk about, you know, sometimes it is a forever thing and that's the right decision for you. Right. And sometimes it's a temporary thing to just get to a reset and take a break from somebody. And all of that can be useful. All of that is worth doing. Uh, yeah. I mean, listen, we're not saying anything that, uh, 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 children who've experienced abuse at the hands of their parents don't know, right? Which is just like, there are things that you can just say, I'm done here. I'm packing it in. Uh, I am extremely grateful to have uh, parents who are receptive enough uh, to really tough conversations. Um, I also have a cheat code. We don't talk about this in the film. Uh, my mom uh, has two master's degrees and a doctorate in early childhood development, like brain development. So she already, yeah. So she knows one of her master's is in counseling, right? Like she, she knows her way around the, uh, around the rodeo. This is not her first time at the rodeo, as they say. Um, <clears throat> so like, again, it's like a little cheat code, <laughs> uh, to have that, uh, parent in the mix. Uh, and a lot of folks don't, have that kind of benefit or opportunity or anything, right? Uh, yeah. And in those cases, sometimes you just got to go no contact. Yeah. And as you say, your life has been easier. And part of that stuff that you were talking about, that internal stuff about like, am I a bad daughter? Am I blah, 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 all of that kind of stuff? Part of that is internal stuff. But a lot of that is people will say it to you. If you say, I'm not currently in touch with X family member, they'll be like, well, you only have one mother. Why would you mother that? Right. All of that sort of stuff. So I think it's also, I mean, not unlike unsolicited diet advice. It's something that people participate in without really thinking about the impact of what it means to 
uh, actually manifest the voice, the like worst inner critic voice that somebody has. Like, you don't need to do that. They already got that going on. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to be that guy. You don't need to be that guy. Yeah. You don't need to comment on that. Yeah. It's very true. It's very true. Yeah. 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 Do you feel like beyond family stuff, do you feel like you've been able to have boundary setting conversations with uh, friends or colleagues or neighbors or whatever that have been more receptive than your family has? Yeah, that's actually been a pretty great one. Am I... Um... Yeah, where my bestie, as I've kind of been going through my fat liberation journey, because I've known her for many, many years, has become like the biggest ally to the point where, you know, she'll buy, she, you know, she knows now if we're going to go to a comedy show or something, she'll make sure there's an aisle seat for me or maybe even the accessible seating. We were at a wedding once and someone made a comment about, uh, oh, Oh, it was a human rights lawyer. And I don't know how we got into this, but I mentioned something about um, weight not being a protected class. And then this lawyer looked at me and I, I don't know, I, I would say that this lawyer was plus size. And I thought we could have kind of an interesting conversation about it, but looked at me and was like, um, no, said the O word is a disease, isn't it? And I took a breath and my bestie, Sabrina, jumped and was like, hang on a minute. Let me tell you why that's not true. And I was like, I'll be at the bar. And I walked away and Sabrina had the conversation. I'm like, it was so great to have like my emotional labor passed off to someone else. So that's actually been pretty amazing. That's incredible. I will say similarly, one of my closest friends in the entire world, um, went to college on a basketball scholarship, like thin person and a jock, which is a powerful combo. <laughs> That's a heady mix, you know? Uh, and uh, when I first started writing, she read my writing and was like, why don't we ever talk about this? And I was like, we could talk about it. And we started having conversations about it. And uh, I would say about a month after she and I started talking, I got a call from another mutual friend being like, man, I had a wild conversation with this friend. I was just saying I had a terrible flight and I had to sit next to a fat person. Uh, and this friend absolutely shut it down and was like, do you know about seatbelt lengths? How would that person know what size the seatbelt was going to be? How would they know the seat width? Is that published anywhere? How would you find it? But Did they pay for a second seat? You don't know. They might have paid for a second seat and it got sold out from under them or they didn't have extra space, but they still got charged. Like really went in and just makes a practice of it. Not in a combative, I said it in a tonally inaccurate way um, <laughs> but uh not in a combative way but just in a like oh huh what do you think they did to prepare for the flight what do you think they blah 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 and just like asking folks to step into the mindset of like what would you do if you needed to find this information what would you do if you needed to ask for a seatbelt extender imagine what that feels like what would you do if people were staring at you on an airplane all of that kind of stuff and it was just like it was such a testament. I didn't talk about it much with friends and family before I started writing, mostly because people just took it so badly when I did. You know what I mean? Like it just went so badly the first few times that I was like, never mind, I'm out. And I think with this jock friend <laughs> and uh, with my parents both, it's a really good reminder to me of, uh, people's ability to grow and their willingness to grow. And then if someone's dedicated to being a good friend, they'll find a way to show up for you. And if someone's dedicated to being a good partner, they will find a way to show up for you, even if they don't know shit about what you're going through, right? Uh, it's, it's really, it feels like the, you know, the old Angela Davis quote of like, you must act as if it's possible to radically transform the world and you must do it all the time, right? That like when you do that, it's both extremely, can be extremely painful as we've talked about, 
but it can also be the biggest, most wonderful surprise. As with your best bud. God, what a wonderful thing. I know. She's become such a great fat ally. Yeah. Well, and I also want to share too, especially for people listening, is like I've started, as I have gotten older and stopped giving a fuck about most things, I've started uh, calling in, um, having really open, com- like in- invitational conversations with organizations that I work with or I see where they're not being size inclusive. And recently, and I, sh- I was sharing the kind of back and forth that happened with a with an organization called Girls Just Wanna Weekend, which is hosted by Brandy Carlisle, the singer songwriter. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And because they were talking about it on, or Glennon and um, Glennon Doyle and Abby Wambach and um, Amanda were talking about it on their uh, We Can Do Hard Things podcast. And I believe Brandy was a guest. And so Sabrina, my bestie, wrote, texted me. She goes, I'm just listening to this. We need to go to this Girls Just Want a Weekend. And I'm like, okay, cool. I love a, I love a, I love an escape. I love a journey. I love an adventure. So I go onto the website and every single marketing picture was thin white women in bikinis. And I immediately was like, oh, this is not a space for me. But let me just, let me just, let me just investigate a little further because they were talking so much about how it was such a focused DEI type space, all about inclusion, blah, blah, blah. Not a single mention in any of the FAQ anywhere on the website about size inclusivity, about seating, um, about accessible spaces, even for people in wheelchairs. There was, I think, a mention of a wheelchair. Um, this is a big outdoor resort, so I had no idea what the bathroom situation would be. They talked about clothing and like things like that uh, that you could purchase, but they don't mention size runs. There was just like a, a real big list. So I decided to write. I just, you know, did the help thing and wrote to them and said, hey, you are really touting this as a diverse and inclusive um, event, and yet I'm not really seeing any evidence of that around size inclusion. Can you please let me know? And I didn't want to do all the work for them. I was like, can you please let me know what you've done to ensure size inclusivity? And basically the back and forth for about five messages was they had no idea what I was talking about, didn't understand anything. And it's probably been about two months. And then I got an email from... um, there, so like I think it's like their head of customer support or success or something like that. We'll say customer support, who actually had a decent-ish, I'll give it like fifty percent response on. Okay, here are the different seating options. They included a picture of the types of chairs. So, and you know, four hundred pound weight capacity. Yes, the the tops, go, the clothing that you can buy goes up to a two x. Happy to talk about what would feel more inclusive. Um, included the dimensions of the bathrooms, kind of like outhouse type bathrooms. Um, so it was actually like quite good, except you know, then the seat widths are eighteen inches, and I'm like, oh, that's that's really small. That's a coach seat. On an airplane, baby, it's one inch more than that. And like, I am i don't like it on a plane. I'm not going to like it at a show. Woo. No, right? For hours and hours. Like, this is like a day-long kind of concert thing. And then you can bring your own chairs. And I'm like, great. But the chairs must also be 18 inches or less. And I'm like, oh, so close, so close. So I'm actually kind of getting ready to respond because I'm happy to engage with the openness, but I don't want to do all this labor if it's not going to go there. So that's like where I think it's it's interesting to see what we can do in an like in a like an organizational not quite systemic necessarily, but like in a in specific instances where because I just think really most people don't think about it. I had another experience with one of the organizations I work for and I sent a message to our head of marketing saying, hey, like we have beautiful marketing and images and we've got lots of cultural diversity, but there's no size diversity. You don't even have anyone who's like above a size six as far as I can see. And I had a conversation yesterday with the person who's in charge of the images and she was like, you know, it just didn't even cross my mind. I'm like, I know. And thank you for, because then the next thing that came out had a plus size woman. And I had sent like Lindley Ashline stock photos. I'm like, they are out there. I'm happy to like support. So I think we can make changes and it makes me feel, it's scary to do. I will say every time I do it, I'm like, oh, 
this is hard. Especially the place that I work for. There's a whole power. I mean, I knew I wasn't going to get fired by any means. Um, but it's still, it's a risk. So I just want to acknowledge the risk of it. But I mean, it, the receptivity at certain, like these two instances has been very heartwarming and and makes me feel hopeful. That is, you just named uh, that sort of curiosity piece and receptivity piece is uh, the way that I usually put it is like, I have an endless capacity for good faith conversations. If someone's trying to get it, but genuinely not getting it, we could talk for hours and hours and hours until they get it. If someone is, uh, you know, sea lioning, if someone is trolling, if someone is any of that sort of stuff, I'm out. You know what I mean? If someone is sort of combative from jump or defensive from jump. Yeah. Prove to me why what you're saying is right. Like that whole thing. Oh, yeah. Well, prove to me why I should care about what you need is what they're functionally saying. Right. Um, uh, I'm I'm out in such a hard way on those kinds of conversations. But again, uh, you know, I would say there are a number of people in my life uh, and in my family who struggle to get it, but are trying. And all I really need is the try it. Do you know what I mean? Like at this point, that threshold may change down the line. Hopefully there will be enough people who are trying that I have to start distinguishing between kinds of trying, right? We're not there right now. Uh, and the trying feels really refreshing. And I wish it were less rare than it is for people to like actually try. One of the things that Jeannie was telling me about was as as you've been taking the film to different theaters, there's been a real commitment to having them measure their seats and put the measurements on the website. And just that like that one little thing suddenly makes the theater so much more um and maybe not accessible, but like allows people to evaluate whether it will be accessible for them. And I just, I love, again, that like organizational level, like place by place by place. <laughs> that was Jeannie's brainchild. And I was like, I could not love this more. Taking our cues from uh, Sophie Hagen, uh, who uh, has set boundaries around, uh, you know, venues that they will uh, do stand up comedy in. Um, based on sort of what kind of seat size information they publish and all of that. Um, no, it's it's huge. And that also then means that if fat people come in and say, hey, I actually need different seating options, that's then not the first conversation staff at that venue are having about seat sizes, right? They're aware on some level that this is a thing that people pay attention to. They're aware on some level that there is some uh, accommodation necessary here and they can kind of uh, roll with it, hopefully a little bit easier. Hopefully a little bit easier. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. My uh, my hairstylist was saying she went to a concert. I posted a video about, I went and saw um, the com the comedian Anthony, I can never say his last name, Jesselnick. Oh, Jesselnick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, and it was the first time I was able to get the accessibility seating. And it was so great. It was basically just like a row of chairs, a mix of open, ar like arms, chairs with arms, chairs with no arms. There was a mix of people there. There was no question. It was so easy. And I did a whole video about it. And she saw it. And so she was going to see Alanis Morissette. And she they, she tried to find accessibility seating information, couldn't. So went to the row where she was going to sit, looked at it and was like, she's like about my size, like around a size 24, looked at it and was like, oh, there's just no way. And so they she felt, she said she went through the whole, like felt the shame, the shame spiral, all of it, but was like, no, I'm going to ask because I want to see this concert. So called over the usher or the seater person and it was very obviously the first time they had ever heard this kind of request. And of course they were like, well, why? And like, they couldn't, it was like their brain didn't connect why. And it basically, she said, she goes, in that moment, all I wanted to was like whisper into their ear. But instead I said, because my fat ass will not be comfortable in this chair and I need a better seat. And I was like, damn. So it was like- Excellent. Right, so good for her, but also like, so hard that it's like when it is the first time someone has heard this uh, accommodation request, 
to have to go through all of that, you know, limbic system activation and stress and Oh, I just want us to not have to feel that on the regs, you know? Absolutely (laughs) agreed. Listen, the end goal here is, to my mind, is that uh, people who are not fat and have not been fat think about this stuff so that we don't have to, right? So that event organizers are thinking about this as a matter of course, uh, and that they're also thinking about disability accessibility as a matter of course, that they're also thinking about um, uh, accessibility for older folks as a matter of course, that they're also thinking about accessibility for people with kids as a matter of course, right? That there are all these different kinds of people who are coming to shows, coming to movies, coming to whatever. Um, But like the more that we can sort of... uh, uh, break the surface, right? Break the seal on that first conversation for folks. Uh, the better off we are. I mean, I think the hard part about that, um, it's their first time having that conversation piece is some of that, not all of it, comes from fat people assuming that folks won't get it and therefore not having the conversation, right? Um, that that shouldn't be on us, but functionally at this point, we can all look around. We know what thin people are up to is not thinking about us and what we need, right? <laughs> like it's just, it's down to us in this particular moment. Um, and the more that we can have those conversations, uh, what I have found is the less I am in that kind of fight or flight kind of feeling in those conversations and the easier those conversations go for me and for them, honestly, but again, I'm a person who does this all the all day long and has for years. And that's a really different position than a lot of folks. Are. Yeah. yeah. Well, in your experience, I mean, this ties into definitely something we wanted to talk about, which was this idea of like, how should non-fat people ask fat people what they need? Like, how does a non-fat person even have that conversation? What can we do as fat people to invite that conversation and and... I don't know, hold, like hold it a little more gently. Um, yeah. What are, do you have any thoughts, tips? How we do that? Yeah. Uh, I would say um, mm, a couple of things. One, I think there's this idea amongst thin people who are starting to tune into this conversation that there's like a massive playbook of like, common pitfalls and failures and things that people do wrong and blah, 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 blah. In my own personal experience, the issue isn't thin people trying too hard and making the wrong choices. The issue is thin people not asking, not caring, not wanting to know, not anything, right? Like just full like horse blinders on, right? Just like tunnel vision on their own Uh, on their own experience. So for folks who are not fat, I would say worry less about doing it perfectly and worry more about doing it at all. Which is the same, it's the same message around like anti-racism work. Like as a white person, it's, it's on, I feel like it's on me to not worry about perfectionism, which of course is a, you know, a construct of systemic oppression um, to prevent me from even trying And just be okay with making a mess, repairing, and moving forward, and like learn. Being in that process. Totally. But even in anti-racism world, there is a pretty big playbook of like, these are common foibles that people make. and There is considerably less of that on fat conversations because there are considerably fewer thin people (laughs) trying stuff. You know what I mean? Um, so is that the book you're writing? No, that's not the book I'm reading. I no, God. No, I do. Uh, I am, uh, uh, working on a, a collection about thinness at some point, but not that's after this one. Um, <laughs> that's after this one. Uh, so that's like thing one is like for folks who are not fat, try something, try showing up for a fat person. It might not be right for them. It might not be right for you. Whatever. Throw some stuff at the wall. Figure out what sticks, right? (laughs) That's the place that we're in is, I would say, 
um, is uh, overwhelmingly my experience is that straight sized folks are not really particularly paying attention unless kind of hit over the head with this kind of stuff, right? So that's what I would say. And then I think the harder part of that conversation lies with fat folks, right? Um, that there is something about uh, being fat uh, in the in the world that we live in um, that leads a lot of fat folks to correctly assume uh, that like nobody's going to care if you assert your needs and boundaries. Nobody's going to care, right? Because of the kinds of experiences that you're talking about, because of seat widths at 18 inches and nobody thinking about anything above a 2X size-wise and all of that kind of stuff, right? Those signals are all around us all the time. And it can feel really scary and vulnerable and painful even to think about what it would look like for people to do right by us because we're so far from that, right? We're so far from that. Uh, and also, once again, act as if it's possible to radically transform the world and do it all the time, right? Uh, the more that I have these conversations with friends who are not fat, uh, the more that they show up and the more, the further that my imagination can go about what it would look like to have someone not just stop saying and doing hurtful things in my presence, but actually shifting the way they think about and see the world and actually thinking about um, what it would look like to feel like deeply affirmed and cared for by that person, right? Again, it's a really painful thing, especially in the shadow of our conversation about going no contact with family members and all of that kind of stuff, right? There's all this very real hurt and harm happening all around us all the time. And at the same time, um, the more that we can imagine, the more that we can envision about a world that works better, the more that we can ask for it, and the more that we can find the people who are willing and able to heed that call and surround ourselves with those people. Do you know what I'm saying? I do. I think it's so true because I think... Um and with another guest, we talked about black futures and like this whole concept. They were, it was like, oh, I'm forgetting. It was like a, probably like a year ago podcast, but they, I was so captivated, captivated by what they were talking about in terms of why they were so interested in black futures is that for so many, for so many marginalized people, black people, BIPOC, the imagination, the, the ability to imagine something different than what is has was like disappearing like people could not imagine a world where they were not treated in negative ways where they were not discriminated against where they did not have constant microaggressions right and i think the imagination piece is so interesting to me aubrey because i agree i do i feel like um there are so many examples I can think of where even like six months ago, last week, where I'll clue into something. I'm like, oh, I hadn't even thought to question that or see it in a different way until someone showed me because my own imagination is so limited by my daily experience. And I hate that. <laughs> it really stinks. It stinks. And it stinks. I, I mean, again, it's a, it can be both difficult as you're naming and also like really emotionally straining to think about how radically different things could be. But if we don't do that and if we don't develop a vision, this is like movement building 101 stuff, right? If you don't have a vision that your movement is driving toward, then you just end up being in the position of going, that's not right, and that's not right, and that's not right, and you're doing it wrong. And but the and like truly who wants to engage with that? <laughs> like, not me, not me, no thanks, right? Um, so we've got to be able to get to some level of positive vision of like, here's what it would look like to be really uh really cared for by people of different sizes than me, right? I will absolutely never forget same friend, same jock friend. Uh uh and I uh went out to uh a bar at one point. We walked in and there were 
booths and there were those sort of barrel chairs with tables and there were bar stools and there were picnic tables in back and there were just like just a just a slew of non-ideal seating so many options so many of them bad um <laughs> for me and my friend was like where do you want to sit and then there was a beat and she went or do you want to go somewhere else and that just was it and just have it like i hadn't even imagined a thin friend doing that at that point right even just opening up like oh hey we don't have to go here what if we went someplace else felt like at the time that to me would have felt like too big an ask to make of her um but her offering it up helped open up my imagination to what else was possible absolutely oh I love that so much. Is that the book you're writing? No. <laughs> I think you're coming up with so many good ideas that I am not working on. <laughs> I do keep wait. I have to say, I love. I'm a big like sci-fi fantasy fan, and I keep wanting. Um, I haven't found it yet, but uh, someone to write a book. And if anyone ha has known of this being written, please tell me. Someone to write a book where it is um, like. There is not the level of oppression where fat people are the main characters. Although I did just talk to an author uh, recently whose main character is non-binary, queer, and fat. And it's a six series story fantasy. And the romantic interest starts about halfway through because they're friends first and they go through their own personal journeys. And then, and it's just, I'm like, oh, this is it. We're starting. We're starting to, people are starting to imagine. Like, that's what I want to read. I just, I want to read things that ignite my imagination of what's possible and what I can dare to ask for or demand in this life, you know? Absolutely. But I, I'm not the best at seeing it, which I, I wish my brain was, but it's just not. And so I, I need it shown. I think most of us are not because it is a systemic issue, right? That that kind of hope gets stamped out all the time in big ways and little ways in you know, medical care and t-shirt sizes, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like really running the gamut of, uh, of how that can look. Yeah. I don't, I don't know anybody to whom that kind of big, bold vision comes naturally. Like, Oh, why don't we just do it like this? You know what I mean? Like, I think it's going to be a stretch for most of us, uh, to get into that, uh, level of kind of brave imagination. Yeah. I feel like that's the role that fat community can play. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Where we can have those conversations. Oh, my friend that did this. Oh, maybe I can ask my friend to do that too. Like it just kind of like grows. That's what my hope is. Yeah, mine too. I Now it's mine too. <laughs> it wasn't before, but now it is. I like it. <laughs> um, Aubrey, I feel like I could talk to you forever and ever. I think you're incredible and I'm so glad that you are out there doing the work that you're doing. So thank you. Um, and as always, it's just such a joy and a pleasure to talk to you. I cannot believe that we have run through. I was like, we're about a third of the way in. I mean, I am happy to keep going. We could do, I know how you and Michael sometimes joke about like, we've been talking for three hours and then I don't know how he edits that down to like a 45 minute or, to, or an hour episode. Like, well, listen, you take out the bathroom breaks and the me telling the same story seven times and you get there. You know what I mean? You get there. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for having me. This is always such a treat. I just love coming on. Yay. Before we go, I'd like to read a poem because poetry can reach our hearts in a different way. Poems can have us feel in a different way. And that's what this podcast is all about expanding our hearts, deepening our empathy, and inviting in joy. So each week, you get a new poem. Aubrey is just such a bundle of smarts and energy and aliveness, which is what I feel when I read this poem by Joy Sullivan. It's called, My Mother Says Kissing a Man Without a Mustache is Like Eating Eggs Without Salt. <laughs> Here it is. My mother says kissing a man without a mustache is like eating eggs without salt. 
which is a better way of saying, take the scenic route. Say, I love you when it's true. Drive 12 hours just to touch. Buy kumquats because they're called kumquats. Call someone you love a little kumquat. Write letters. Recite poems. Be verklempt. Rise early to hunt the moon. Eat pastries whose names you can't pronounce. Astonish everyone. Haunt everything. Sing even if poorly. Press the peel for zest. We're nothing but brief bodies. Hearts fragile as parakeets. Spit lips and longing. All we've got is this skin. This necessary salt. Thank you for joining me today. My hope is that you're feeling a little less alone and a little more seen. So until the next episode, you can find me on Instagram at fatjoy.life, on YouTube at youtube.com slash at fatjoy, and on Substack at fatjoy.substack.com. And please do check out the episode notes for how you can connect with my amazing guest and for the links to the poem. All right, lovely. I am sending you off with my best wishes for an abundantly fat joy day. And we'll talk again soon.